Hi everyone, I'm Sheldon. I am a product manager at Avid Technology. We make uh, audio and video equipment that spans everywhere from consumer products like DJ and uh, consumer video all the way up to live sound mixing consoles, professional audio workstations, and, uh, and even broadcast uh, media centers. Um, I represent the live sound part of our business because that's an area where there's a lot of interest in AVB and a lot of development, um, even as we see rock and roll touring head into that uh, brave new world of networked and distributed audio. So that's why I'm here to speak to you today, and I'm here with John McMahon from Meyer. Thanks, Sheldon. So Meyer Sound uh, manufactures loudspeakers, uh, audio distribution, uh, audio show control systems. We uh, span the, the, uh, a very wide range of markets everywhere from installations, uh, restaurants, uh, up to large concert tours, and, uh, and some of these big applications that we're talking about today uh, all rely on Meyer Sound products. My role in the company is to oversee the digital product side of things, so uh, ABB is one of the, the big things on my to-do list right now, so, so thank you. Oh, I guess I'm I'm next. <laughs> so, uh, so what we're talking about here today is uh, large performance systems. So, um, and some applications around that. So, just to define what a large performance system is, is typically it's concert halls, performing arts centers, theaters, uh, touring. Um, in, in general, there's a centralized PA with some secondary distribution off to other rooms, there, there may be broadcast feeds, um, and uh, typically recording. So, you know, we, we work a lot with Vikram on a lot of the shows that he puts together. Um, in general, in audio, there's mixing consoles, loudspeakers, microphones, RF comms, there's video integrated with these systems, and uh, importantly, there's multiple points of system status monitoring and control. Uh, often within the same set of processing, there may be front of house that sees uh, these processors, there may be monitor mix, broadcast feeds, all these different um, ways to control the system are typically um, uh, all sharing the, the same system but from different aspects and different needs. So this is what, what we're considering a uh, large performance system, so these are performance orientated. Um, so you're, you're going to start to hear a lot of the same themes emerge here as we talk, and, and kind of speaks to the, uh, you know, the capabilities of AVB to actually address all of the different applications um, that we as manufacturers deal with. Uh, in thinking about large performance systems, um, we wanted to pull out just a few of the things that might be unique or relevant to that type of installation compared to some of the other installations or applications that you'll be hearing today. Um, you know, one of them is that we do have high channel counts, and these tend to be fairly centralized. You have a performance space, you have a number of sources on stage, and you need to get those sources uh, to one, two, or ten dif different destinations. So there's a, a big bandwidth need there, and uh, you have to make sure that you can get that audio uh, to those different destinations. Um, when you start thinking about some of the big PA systems that, uh, that you see um, hung in a, a place like a Cirque installation, or even just a, a typical rock and roll arena show, you've got multi-zone PAs, there's complex distribution going on there, and you want to make sure that the audio is hitting those speakers at precisely the same time. Uh, the last thing you want is your network introducing a variable in there that you as the operator can't see or can't control. So the presentation time uh, built into AVB is the thing that's going to solve that problem for us and make sure that your speakers are uh, going to remain face coherent throughout. Um, lip sync's always an issue. Uh, can be an issue if you've got separate audio and video streams. Perhaps they travel different paths, get processed differently. You want to make sure that, that uh, those two sources sync up in the end. And again, that's something that is uh, going to be possible with AVB with the presentation time. And uh, low latency, if you're thinking about real-time kind of live performance applications, something as simple as making sure the artist on stage hears themselves and hears themsel hear themselves in, uh, uh, you know, with little or no perceptible <coughs> delay is going to be key. So if, uh, if the latency spec wasn't going to be able to be met by AVB, you know, we as a manufacturer wouldn't be at all interested in it. And uh, as Matt's touched on, one millisecond, uh, even sub-millisecond latencies can be possible. Uh, even the default two milliseconds can be um, can be uh, practically used in the real world. Um, thinking about reliability, you know, it's a big it's a big rock and roll show. It's a big theater. There's a lot of money being spent here in a one-hour span. You want to make sure that, that system is up and it stays up 
during the show. The last thing you want is for the sound to start and then something to happen on your network and the sound goes away. You've got 20,000 people looking at you going, what just happened? Um, so uh, things like the guaranteed bandwidth, the stream reservations, those are the things that are going to make sure that you make a connection and once that connection's made, it stays made for the duration of that. Uh, redundancy, you're able to leverage the infrastructure that's built into IT. Vikram touched on some of those aspects of link aggregation uh, as a means of, of creating a backup path or an alternate um, solution should something happen, should the forklift go over your cable, as we always like to say. Um, and not every system is going to have an IT guy uh, in the room or even in the building. Uh, so having it be simple to set up, simple to use, uh, I know everybody's kind of said this throughout the course of the day, I'll just echo it. Um, you connect a bridge, you connect a multi-node or even a multi-switch network, you want to be able to just have that just work. You don't want to have to sit there and have to go in and start dialing in um, to the switch level um, all the different parameters just to kind of finally tune your system. That's just not sustainable. It's not uh, something that you can maintain on an ongoing basis in uh, some of these applications and installations. Uh, remember, these are roadies in some cases that set this thing up every day. Uh, and I say that with a lot of respect. But, uh, oh, yeah, it sounded like it. That's right. <laughs> I was one of them. Um, but it's the kind of thing that it just, the last thing they want to worry about is why, why is my switch not configured the way it was yesterday uh, when they're loading into an arena. So those are some of the things um, that are key. This is one that is, I think is fundamental, interoperability. So the ability to actually have devices from multiple manufacturers, Vikram touched on this as well. Um, you know, this is key, and this is us as a manufacturer, knowing that we can't possibly own every piece of your system unless we're Harman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Adam, couldn't resist that one. Um, uh, but you know, it, it helps us sell more product if we can communicate to more devices from other manufacturers that suit you know, your needs. And as a manufacturer, um, we're inundated with these protocols. Um, I'm not going to call them standards because they're not. They're protocols. Uh, we're inundated with this stuff. Uh, every trade show, there's a new one. So we have to kind of sort through that noise. And you have to take the long view on these things. And you go, what are the things that have really changed uh, how we uh, develop and deploy systems? And they tend to be the things that are those open standards, those things that are available to manufacturers, things like AES, EBU. Things like MADI, those are things that we use today. Those have long legs. Uh, as a manufacturer, we also love it because it's not a, a single source. You know, we're not going to a single provider for that technology or that IP. It's something that we can sit there, we can look at the standard, we can go, yeah, we can turn a team of engineers loose on this and solve a problem for you guys. So that's the thing that we as a manufacturer really care about. Uh, at the end of the day, you guys just care, does audio flow, does video flow, does it, does it work, is it easy to set up? Um, but those are the things that have really tipped us towards uh, AVB. So, um, you know, with that, I'm going to kind of wrap up and I'm going to turn it over to our distinguished guest speaker, um, Mr. Sam Burkow. If you've ever seen what you were hearing, you probably owe this man uh, a drink. So Sam is the founder of uh, SIA Smart and uh, uh, the Smart Analysis Software, uh, acoustic designer, system designer uh, of, of many, many high-quality, high-performance installations including things like the Jazz at Lincoln Center. Um, and he is here to talk to you, uh, kind of give you his unbiased perspective on, <laughs> right, we didn't pay you for this, did we? <laughs> you will, right? Not, not yet, what? anyway. I'm not getting paid, um, I leave. <laughs> you're getting paid at least twice what we're getting paid for there this you go. <laughs> um, And so he'll give you kind of his perspective on how he does that, and uh, he'll take you through a couple of his installations and where he sees AVB fitting into them. You got a communist? You don't want to hang out? So I thought it was interesting that they said large performance spaces. And I thought we'd just take a minute and talk about what large means. Because a trend in performing arts is that small spaces have very increasingly complex requirements. Why? Because almost no facility can afford to exist now with its paid audience. So every technical director, every producer thinks that whatever is going on is worthy of being recorded and showing up someplace where someone's going to pay for it either in real time or later. Right? It's either a download or a webcast or a podcast or something. So every facility um, becomes a potential production facility. Once you get into production, the, the channel counts start getting up into the hundreds as you saw very, very quickly. Um, the complexity of these systems is increasing to support this ability to generate new revenue at a time when capital operating and maintenance costs are all under incredible pressure. 
right? So we have this, this sort of diametrically opposed forces, the need to do more complex things like multi-track recording, post-production, production on the fly, webcasting, video recording, real near broadcast quality production, even in small venues at the time when everyone's under more and more money pressure to operate under less hours and build with less dollars. Uh, we see a non-proprietary digital network as a key piece of this. I thought I'd show you two examples to talk about. One of them is a project that's going to open later this month in Boulder, Colorado, and it's 200 seat performance space. Now, it's hardly large by anyone's standards, right? I mean, it's a tiny little space, except for the fact that it has a 2,000 square foot recording studio and three post-production suites directly behind the stage. And they'll be doing live to web uh, things and 80,000 people download the podcast every week. It's a pretty big audience. And the system is not fundamentally different than a premier music venue here in Las Vegas, the Pearl at the Palms. I was very, very fortunate and it doesn't happen very many times in the life of an acoustical consultant when the owner of a facility says, let's have the architects report to you and you figure out what it is we need to build and I get to play God on a project. Um, yeah, it's really fun. Um, this is a 20, uh, well, this is a 2600 seat performance space. It's located at the Palms Hotel. Um, it's really a fun venue. And what makes it interesting is that uh, it's tied to a world-class recording facility 900 feet away up in the towers. So you have a concert hall, stage racks, and you have both a proprietary network and 96 copper lines doing the 900 feet run. That's not inexpensive to do. I can tell you that it took man weeks to set up the proprietary network and get it to work. Now it actually does work and it works reliably and well, but man weeks to set something up, now it was early in this particular network's life. Um, one of the questions that's come up, and I think this yeah, gives me the pointer, it's a little hard to see, but there's an extremely long line array here. It's a 20 box uh, high mid pack array. And one of the things that uh, I know the folks at Meyer do a lot is uh, cardioid subwoofer arrays. They make cardioid boxes, you can do them in cardioid arrays. To make cardioid subwoofer arrays work, you need to address each individual speaker. So the number of outputs go up. In this case, it's 22, it's 20 high mid boxes. We wanted 22, but the fly bars weren't rated for it. Um, but you have six zones of loudspeakers in the main array, and you have six zones of loudspeakers in the subarray. That's 24 outputs just for the left and right. That doesn't include the center cluster or front fills or subs that are down the deck, additional subs that we have. So it's not uncommon that a basic system will have upwards of 36 outputs for just the front of house to the main loudspeaker uh, clusters and delays. Um, you can see here the front of house position and you can see the sub array there and the main array there. Now these are ridiculously large arrays. This is Las Vegas and the owner of the facility sort of insisted that they didn't want anyone to have an excuse not to use their system, like you don't have enough PA. Uh, also, because they record everything, the longer line arrays give you more control uh, on stage. So making the line array long means that you're down at 250 hertz, you're probably down almost 30 dB on stage from 15 feet in front of the stage. It's pretty impressive, actually. Now, how does the AVB fit in? All of this distribution costs money. At Jazz and Lincoln Center, which is arguably built in one of the most expensive buildings to do construction in, in uh, New York City, the conduit cost was $8.6 million. All right? Here at the Pearl, the conduit cost, because we were going 900 feet up here and 800 feet up there, started pushing almost to seven figures. It was in the solid six-figure number. So if there's a realistic way to reduce the amount of copper and the amount of piping, and it could be replaced by fiber and CAT6, these people want to know about it. 
Uh, in this case, it was early in the proprietary digital network world, about five years ago that we installed it, and we specified it about 18 months before that. So we specified side-by-side -side copper and uh, digital. Oh, okay. um, this is a drawing showing you the layout, and I was just gonna point out that the rock room is on stage left, there's an elevator on stage right, front of house position, and you can get a little feel for the scope of the room. This is uh, one of 17 or 18 pages of block diagrams of the audio panels and system diagrams showing all of these connections. And each of these guys, these vertical things, you can't really read it, this is a little small, say audio patch bay. One of the things that makes performing arts centers performing arts centers and makes them rather unique is that they have to be flexible because you can't tell, uh, you can't tell directors and producers and people in the arts how they have to do something. You think having a general is bad, Matt, yell at you. Try having some irate producer and director. Oh my God. I'll take, I'll take the general any day. Performing arts people are the craziest people in the world, which is why we love them and why we want to kill them. <laughs> right? So we have 17 pages of these diagrams for this 26, 100 seat hall. And the 200 seat hall doesn't have much less because you need the same functionality. You need to be able to break in and out of the system to accommodate all sorts of accommodation. <coughs> It's a tiny little 200 seat room. This is the hall that will open at the end of the month in Boulder, Colorado. It's E-Town Hall. And it presents a number of challenges. Um, one challenge it presented with this floor had to be replaced uh, because it wasn't structurally sound. There's a second performance space directly below here. The upstage wall, this is new steel we put in to hold the place up. This upstage wall is common to the recording studio on the other side. So we had to decouple, you see we cut out the stage and rebuilt it as a completely floated, decoupled stage and wall, interior box, in box construction on both sides, and we went back and grout filled the wall. The reason I tell you this is there aren't many, many uh, locations where we could get conduit through. We were physically eliminated. This particular building was built in the 1920s, and there are literally nine different levels. The, the recording studio of that stage height, or approximately stage height, the recording studio ends up another nine feet below it. And the offices are seven feet below it. There's all these offsets. And there are only so many places you can get through. We're actually physically running out of space for conduit. So the desire to use a digital network and we do have a proprietary digital network uh, being installed, uh, would be much better served if we didn't have to have copper backup and we believed in it and we were sure it had interoperability and we could have the console talk to the DSPs, talk to the loudspeakers. I wouldn't need a two foot wide cable tray, which is what I have in there. This is not an insignificant amount of money. This, um, this is two pictures side by side. Uh, this picture, shows you um, a group of relatively sizable pieces of conduit. This is one of three such groups for audio and video coming into our rack room. This is for a 200 seat performance space. Uh, it's doing live broadcasts weekly. They're doing multi-track recording. They've got a recording studio that has to tie to the performance space. They've got a monitor mix position. They've got web distribution. They're taking feeds in from the, the theater down the block where we have a full distribution, which we're hoping to do via uh, an Avid console, by the way. Um, this shows you the panels on the side of the stage, showing you uh, tech power, input panels, and the amount of conduit floating around just on stage left to allow a monitor. The panels obviously haven't been fitted out with connectors yet. But again, this is a real issue in the performing arts in that the uh, connectivity has become a considerable part of the budget. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, again, in this particular case, at E-Town we have a stage, the recording studio below here, front of house to stage, out to uh, clusters which have five 
uh, small line, a small format line array with five speakers, set up two, two, and two, and one for shading. We only shade the high frequencies to keep the thing working as much as a complete line as possible. But that's still three outputs per cluster, plus sets of subs on each side, plus front fill, plus side fill, plus, plus, plus. Even in a small venue, you have large venue problems or challenges. The studio is a full control room with uh, 64 channels of mic inputs in the studio hitting the control room, which ties to a post-production room with a ISO booth, a second post-production room, and a little video control editing room. There's also a server rack room back over in, over in uh, here. So, I'm sorry. Whoop. Back over here somewhere um, that, that hosts all of the uh, network hubs. <coughs> Uh, the production suites here. Here is the E-Town uh, space by space interconnectivity. And you start to see the distribution challenges you face uh, in a small venue. It's almost identical to the Pearl, which is almost identical to Jazz at Lincoln Center, which is very similar to someplace like Camden Yard. The, the differences are just distances between DSP hubs and the number of channels. But the, the differences are not as great as you might think. I, I see Ron from on stage laughing. It's like a rock and roll show. You, the channel count starts going through the roof, and you can't imagine why until you realize that you've got a 16 or 18 element cardioid subarray, and you need 18 outputs for it or 16 outputs for it. There you go. Um, in our case, we have a performance hall, uh, a community gathering room, our server room, green rooms and dressing rooms, video control, two post rooms, uh, and our main, uh, con our main studio control room and the studio itself. And all of these connections, right, have to be currently analog and digital. Why? Because our clients are demanding it because they're all crazy. My hope, right, my hope is that once AVB becomes a standard adopted, uh, an adopted standard and widely used, that the copper gets greatly diminished. In the classical music world, there are all sorts of people who won't use digital consoles. We fool them all the time. It's ridiculous. You know? uh, but that's legacy, and that's the challenge of introducing a new technology. Um, so my hope is that AVB will reduce costs and complexity. The digital networking from stage to front of house to the record and broadcast are all multi-channel splits. Uh, we'd like to, I saw some folks from ClearCom here, we'd love to see, you know, um, uh, communication run on the same network. In the performing arts facilities, they're so happy to reduce the amount of cable, uh, of copper, that we're not so worried about uh, <coughs> letting other people run on our network. I have no problem running a dedicated set of fiber, dedicated set of, set of CAT6 cables for our use only because it's a show. I don't need anyone else. I can firewall off or I can bridge off. As Vikram pointed out, you can put a LAN or a firewall between you and the rest of the world. I really don't need anything that's not our company data running on our network. And I think there's a huge amount of savings to be realized for these people. And in fact, it makes them feel special. It's like putting a voice processor for the announcer at a ball game. It may be the same thing that's in the channel strip, but he wants it in the rack with his name on it. If you tell them that the green cable is your network only and the orange cable is everyone else, they're going to say, well, we don't like that color, but good. <laughs> um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is when all of these loudspeakers are individually addressable and I can start tweaking things and steering line arrays via uh, the AVB interface and the digital signal processors. I think that's... Uh, a potentially huge thing. I think one of the best things to happen to live sound in recent years uh, is cardioid subwoofer arrays. I think they really improve uh, what happens on the stage. They clean up the stage a lot, making it easier for front of house guys to get really tight, great sounding mixes. And uh, I think that I'd like to see that happen more and more. And I think that AVB is one way to make that happen uh, really well. And um, that basically 
is what we're saying is that we want multi-channel DSP for proper system tuning throughout to be part of the uh, seamlessly integrated into the uh, distribution network. Uh, so Sheldon, John, you want to flute up here? We'll take a couple questions. Did, did we do okay on time here? I didn't look. I think we're good, right? Who's us? Now, I, I look around the room. I've known a lot of you guys since I had hair. And none of you guys are that shy. Uh, the, would the ClearCom guys announce if you're talking to the AVB folks at all? Yes. Yes. <laughs> the ClearCom guys in the back of the room say yes, they're interested in AVB. We're here, so we can even talk to you. There you go. Obviously, we have wireless also, so it's very free. That's right. Oh, um, tomorrow uh, I've been authorized, I guess, is the word. Um, or asked if I want to, if you guys want to come, uh, I'm leading the Infocom tour of the Pearl tomorrow morning. Uh, it's at 10.30 and you guys are welcome to come by and uh, we meet at the entrance of the Pearl at the Palms. Uh, it's, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a really, really interesting space. A uh, really fun uh, concert venue and uh, uh, a room I'm really proud of. Um, certainly welcome to join us in Heckle. Yeah. You and I were talking about encryption. Let's get the boys in the back to I, I was about. asked not to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Ken brings up one of the things that, that I've asked the, the AVB people to consider for the next round is an encryption scheme. Um, remember that almost everything that happens on our network is copyrighted material. And this idea of having the network serve all these other purposes scares the living bejesus out of our people that our stuff's going to go disappearing. So one of the things we want to do is be able to use an encryption scheme that we can give a code to or a seed number to all of our devices or come up with a scheme that makes people feel a bit protected. But I don't think that's a major concern. It's just a secondary issue. Yeah, so, so actually just on that point, there is a uh, the transport protocol that Lee talked about earlier for transporting the audio uh, over AVB, there's a, there's a ratified standard right now for carrying that. That does not include encryption. However, there is a new uh, draft being circulated right now of the next generation, which does include encryption for, for the audio and video. Yeah, I think it's also worth pointing out that um, just because it's a network, nothing's changed. You still need to have secure networks out there. So they can only pull the audio off uh, or the content off if they can get on. So making sure that that's, that's yeah. locked down is going to be a key part of your, uh, your working practice as well. I wanted to uh, encourage those that are working on that encryption thing to think about courtroom systems, because every unique courtroom space has got to have uh, secure data uh, as well. Yeah, that's huge. Any other questions? Yeah, one down in front here. Can you say a little Sure. So a uh, question is, can I speak a little bit more about video and maybe uh, how it pertains to Avid? So uh, there's, there's lots of awareness of video within Avid, um, and there are people actively involved in it. Is it something that is kind of fundamental to the Avid workflow? It's not, actually, because we do a lot of faster than real-time workflows where it's all file-based transfers. That's the way that world is going. Um, we tend to be downstream of the, of the capture, which is where the benefits of AVB will be most uh, likely realized. So once it's coming from the camera into the network and we're going to uh, ingest it at that point, you know, that's where the front end is going to be where the AVB uh, connection occurs. Um, whereas for Avid, most of our products, like I said, are going to be on the back end where things, uh, they want things to be faster than real time and file-based. Um, does that answer your question? Um, this is where I'm going to raise my hand and go audio guy, and I'll defer to anyone else in the room that knows a little bit more about the video aspects of it. <coughs> anyone want to field that, or we can, we can follow up with you afterwards? In the back? Uh, question. Uh, you were talking about synchronizing. You were talking about synchronizing the audio to the video uh, when you do a breakout, and I was, I was wondering what the 
you don't have to get too detailed what the mechanism is. If I start with a, a feed out of a Blu-ray player or something, and my audio is going to go through all kinds of other routing, equalization, blah, 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 before it gets republished with the video image, uh, how do you tag that and say it's got to link with this video thing all the way to the end? Because there's a lot of processing that might go on in the middle of that. Yeah. There is a lot of processing that goes on in the middle, and that processing may even be device-specific or device-dependent. Um, so there are actually mechanisms within 1722.1 where they can report their processing delay, and that can all be built into kind of the more intelligent controller system that's, that's controlling those streams and making sure that they play out at the same time. I, I could add one, one thing to that. Um, one of the, the rules of, of audio that's become clear and I, I think we can all agree on is over the last years has become really imperative, is that just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? And we've all walked into rooms where someone's got a compressor, limiter, delay, EQ, crossover, and then on each output of the crossover, a compressor, limiter, delay, and EQ, right? And they wonder why their system sounds bad. Um, I recently came into a guy, his system was tuned amazingly well, but it was way out of time alignment because he had a lot of FIR filters uh, in, a, in a fancy processor, but he was adding almost 30 milliseconds of delay. He didn't have video sync anymore, right? And the sound, the you know, measure's great, but it's so, I don't understand why it's so far out of time. I'm like, because your filters are 30 milliseconds long, they're delaying uh, your signal. You can't use those filters. Now, this is a nightmare, right? But there's nothing to stop people from using long delays and, and processing, creating processing delays that you don't want to synchronize to. So, I mean, this comes down to proper understanding what you're doing at each step of the way. And I wish someone would develop a tool you could measure those delays. And, and on that shameless plug, I, uh, I think we'll wrap up our section here. I, I, I say, I don't get paid anymore. <laughs> and uh, we'll turn it over to, uh, to Henning. He's going to talk to you. Uh, about Riedel's per perspective on ADB. Okay.